Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Direct Xbox number 13. Bit of a change up. Nate has some prior engagements. He has to he has to attend Friday night. So rather than skip, reschedule any of that, we decided we would record it ahead of time. We're just we're recording this Thursday night and then we would just put it up as a premiere on Friday so it'll still be something people can watch and participate in and that sort of thing. But I thought we'd come together here, go for about an hour and just go over some of the recent topics that have happened. It's been a little slower, I feel like for Xbox, but there are still some stuff we can we can discuss, especially some recent things that just happened with some third party games, some uh, some different studios that are going independent. We got Game Pass games for March. I have some hypotheticals for either Sea of Thieves or maybe a Final Fantasy here. We'll see. We have the partner showcase. Let me go over here, though, to the usual co-host. That is Nate the Hate. Yeah, it's definitely been a slow couple of weeks for the Xbox, I think. Or I'm hopeful that the next episode we do, the one following this, will mm. hopefully have something exciting, some Xbox-related news for us to talk about. And ideally... Nothing happens on Friday, the day this will go up as a premiere that we won't be able to discuss. But given the trend of Xbox news lately, I feel pretty confident that the recording tonight, Thursday night, will probably cover everything related to Xbox for this week. Okay. Of course, if you want to support the show, you can go over to spawncastnetwork.com or patreon.com slash spawncast is linked down below. We also have our running sponsor actually for the last couple of months now, that being the Game Orb. They're also linked down below in the description. Check them out. Go say hi. Tell them the Spawncast sent you. They have uh, channels on YouTube and on Twitch where they're streaming gameplay, exploring different conventions. A lot of fun over there. So check out Game Orb. They're linked down below. And I do also want to give a shout out to some of the supporters over on Patreon. We have executive tiers producers with John O, Joshua Butts, Mr. Joby, William Hogue. And I want to give a special shout out to Trent A, who's a producer over there. Of course, if you uh, want to support again, you can head on over to spawncastnetwork.com and have your name read out here. We have all kinds of producer roles in there. So shout out to everyone supporting over on the network. So I've been uh, I've been out and about most of the day, and it's been it's just been it's been fun. If you if people missed it, I was on the non Nintendo podcast talking about non Nintendo stuff and then some Nintendo stuff. But it's a lot of driving around in New York, which is mostly just sitting in your car in New York. So it takes like an hour, Nate, to go six miles. So it um yeah, took a while I mean... to get out of there. <laughs> Manhattan driving has never been fun. That's why when I frequent New York, I always just take the train in. I will walk the city, you know, if I'm going to a certain destination. Never really do the subway system. And if I have to take a vehicle, you just hail a cab or you get in a nice town car and they will take you where you need to go. But the, the weather was nice was today. Nice. So. It, it was. We, we walked around a little bit. But the parking garage was nice because you don't actually have to park your car. They park it for you. So that's kind of nice. With the yeah, get, nice get, little concierge service. Yeah, whenever I go into like Baltimore, you got to park your car yourself. So you got to find a spot, and usually it's on like the eighth floor, and then you got to go all the way back down, and then hope you remember where it is. And everyone just parks mm. on top of each other. Basically, there was nice. They just they they pulled it around, and I was out. So that part was good. But then reality hits, and you have to drive in New York, and it's it's not it's very boring. <laughs> so. Uh, but that that was good. It's uh, that I think that's up now is live stream. I had, had a lot of fun over there uh, on uh, on Wood Show Nintendo. Uh, but let's uh, let's talk about some of the topics this week, Nate. As I said, I picked out a few here. I do want to start with one that it's really funny because I feel like you are not at all familiar with this. That being the Battlefront Classic Collection. Oh my god. I feel like this hurt many people, but not you at all. You're just over on the sideline. Nope. You, you don't know what's going on. You're like, yeah, whatever. Eh, who cares? This yeah, pretty much. I mean, Star Wars, something I'm not invested in. Disaster. You don't really have to be a Star Wars fan that will like these games. I mean, Never it is. Them. Yeah, that's still amazing to me because I, I feel like everyone I know has some kind of experience with either Battlefront 1 or Battlefront 2. Like everyone I know, if I bring up one of those to them and I'm not like the new ones, the, the old ones, they're supposed to be good. Most people go, oh, I remember at least trying that at one point at a friend's house or owning one of them. You nope. not at all for you. 
never. I mean, I had friends who played the games, but it was never anything of interest to me. I would look at them, I'd see the reviews, I'd see the screenshots and everything, and I never had any desire to play them. And even with this new release, still no desire to play them. And it seems as though my instincts were correct because once again, Aspire has aspired to let us down. Oh, play more okay. I. But, um, it's harder and harder. I would say defend Aspire, but give them the benefit of the doubt on releases because it, it keeps happening. It does. It keeps happening. And I, they're going to deal with some kind of class action lawsuit thing, I'm sure, on that Nice Order Public 2 situation. This one, though, hurt because it there was genuine excitement around this. And man, what did I, I? So I got the game early. All right. And I'm playing it the day before. And the online servers weren't up yet. Because I went to the multiplayer thing and it was like uh, server busy or when it did finally show it, there just weren't enough people to fill up the server anyway. because like no one had it. But as soon as it went public, people on Steam first noticed that they had three servers open. Okay, each server can hold 64 people. And that's it. So less than 200 people could technically be in a game at any time. 10,000 people attempted to play when the game went live. So, so somewhere in the area <laughs> of uh, 9,800 people couldn't play the game online. Yeah, I, that, but that was the draw was all, like, look, you can play it all mm. offline with bots, which if you think about that's kind of impressive too at that time. Think, we're playing this on like the PS2 even, right? Original Xbox PS2. You could have you and like 40 or 50 bots or something just running around. Same here. You could do that. And actually it worked well offline. There is auto aim that does help. It pulls your reticule to you know, enemies or people in front of you. Um, but when you go online currently, it barely works. It crashes constantly. So people on PC who are now getting into the game, the game for some reason ends after three or four minutes, which is strange. And there's that rubber banding effect where you're running for like five or six seconds. And then all of a sudden it teleports you ahead like 20 feet. Like it's, it's not synced up correctly. Mm-hmm. So why are matches such a short period of time? Is this something that you can customize in settings or do they just, it just have... ends. It just ends for some reason. No one really knows was no knew why they were just like, it, the game keeps ending after a couple these game, these matches are supposed to last it's like, like 10 to 15 minutes. If I'm thinking right, maybe more than 15 minutes. You have to just deplete the stock of the, uh, the other team. And there are so many people that that pool goes down pretty quick. But it, uh, it it was just glitching out and ending. And now I'm looking at this thinking, that's everyone's first impression for this classic collection. It's over. Like, in my mind, it's like they've, they've lost them after day one. Well, that'd be, yeah, that'd be my first thought is, how would you possibly recommend this game to anybody? And even if you have purchased it and you're running into all these issues, if you're still within that refund time frame, I'd be looking for a refund on this product. And even if you do come out with a patch, Aspire is able to address this, let's say in a somewhat timely manner of a week to 10 days. Is that enough? And never mind, the price is fair. I believe it's what, about $35? Yeah, I'd say that's fair for that, yeah, for the two okay. games. But then you have to look at the file size. Why is the file size so huge across <laughs> various platforms like bytes or something on the xbox yeah why is why is the game such a huge file size because as you said these are playstation 2 xbox games that have really just been slightly enhanced with hd textures and such these aren't full-on remasters or even remakes these are just a typical aspire tier project so you have huge installations a non-functional online right now the only positive seems as though it is fairly priced I'll ask MVG on the Spawncast Saturday night why he thinks the file size is so large. Maybe he can give us a better indication on that uh, for because obviously he moves games from older systems to newer systems. And maybe he can say, OK, well, this is probably why the file size jumps so much. That did surprise me when I first saw that. That is like, whoa, that is way larger than I was expecting for the collection of Battlefront games. But it so I ask if I ask someone about. Okay, so did you ever, you didn't play Battlefront 2 then, Nate, like the one that EA released, was that 2016, 2017? I, I did play that because I didn't, I played it for some reason. It was either, what did I play? That was the one I went through the loot box stuff. Remember that? Yeah, they either had like an open beta or it, Hmm. 
or there was it was on PlayStation Plus or something. I remember I was able to play it without having to buy the game. I just forget how I was able to do that and didn't stay with that very long, maybe a handful of hours a weekend before I bounced off. So people talk about how EA they they removed a lot of the stuff that people were mad at, the the loot box stuff, and most people don't know that because they never went back, never bothered to look nothing and this isn't this isn't like them basically cha- like if they changed the entire game for this and added loot boxes in and stuff i'd be like oh okay yeah that's definite people are definitely not coming back now but i do wonder if they can write the ship a bit and all of a sudden it starts actually working if people would come back but it just feels like it's deeper than that because on the switch I- i'll tell you now if you play it in handheld mode it it feels unplayable because there is no auto aim and or like aim assist and the Joy-Con sticks do not have enough travel for it to make sense otherwise uh, with that. So you want to use a pro controller on the Xbox. It's a bit easier on the PlayStation controller, sure. Or on PC, keyboard, and mouse. But that really hurts it there. And then just on the other platforms, it's so laggy at times and unstable that they just, it feels like they have so much work to do to get the thing right that I, I kind of feel like we're like a month off from them getting it right. <laughs> It makes you wonder why was this game even released in this state? It doesn't sound as though it was ready. It needs you know what they needed? Needs more beta. time in the oven. Yeah, it <laughs> they needs need a beta, beta to test out the servers, <laughs> you know, test that load and see how everything functions. This just sounds like it came in half baked and they're going to fix it as people engage with the game, and you cannot get away with that anymore. Some AAA games, you know, they still try. Payday three rings a bell. Look how that mm. went. Yeah, he's going Theo's out. (laughs) Yeah, now you look at the Star Wars game, and it's kind of a shame because Aspire did just come off one of their higher quality releases with the Tomb Raider collection that was well received. Players have enjoyed returning to that classic trilogy. And now you come in with this that, as you said, a lot of Star Wars fans were looking forward to. And it kind of released at a good window where it's between major releases. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth just came out, and Dragon's Dogma is just over the horizon. So this game could have carved itself a nice little market for the next few weeks. But by the time these problems are going to be addressed, it's very likely Dragon's Dogma 2, Rise of the Ronin and such will be on the market. And players are just going to move over to that. That's where they're going to spend all their time. And this game's going to fall by the wayside. But given the quality of this release, that's where it belongs. It belongs kind of in the bin. What a shame. This should this should have been a slam dunk easy release praise everywhere sales all over the place if there were ten thousand people on steam just waiting right away to play it that tells me there was a, a significant number of people probably on the other platforms as well and this this could have been one of aspire's better selling games outright and it's it's kind of a shame because i feel like the refunds came in pretty quick so yeah i mean <sighs> hopefully the customer is using their right to a refund here this isn't a complete game and you shouldn't reward them with a purchase. Wait for them to fix it. And if it's something that still interests you, buy it then. But in the current state, it's not worth the money. Just so, run the, just take, they could have taken Battlefront 1 even, or even Battlefront 2, one map, and just test it. Okay, open beta. Whoever wants to join in can play it. We're going to open servers. Go ahead and crush them as much as you can, and we'll go from there and figure it out. And they didn't. And it's just, it's weird to me. They didn't, it feels like they just didn't anticipate it and it doesn't have cross play. So they kind of have to think and divvy up servers, I guess. I'm not sure how that works, but it seems like they just were unprepared for, uh, so it's weird. It's battlefront. Like I would look around and go, you know, th- I think this is going to do well. Let's, let's get, let's get more servers in than we think we need. And we'll go from there. And uh, they, they did not, unless they really thought three, three was enough, which, I don't know who, who told them that. And that's the thing. Did they think nobody was going to buy the game? It kind of feels like that with that initial setup. I mean, three servers on PC is you're you're expecting not even 200 people to buy your game at launch. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, this just sounds like complete mismanagement and incompetence yes. by, I guess it'd be Aspire and Embracer leading up to this launch. And that's, I mean, that's just disrespect to the IP of these games. I mean, this is a large, this is a high caliber game based on the legacy that you spoke of and to treat it so haphazardly, it's insulting to the fans. So 
I mean, what's happening here? This is the second time Aspire has messed up with a Star Wars release. As you mentioned earlier with the Knights of the Old Republic 2 on the Switch, where they promised you were going to the DLC expansion content, which they then had to come out and say, oh yeah, we're not doing that. And because some individuals bought the game under the condition that they would be getting that expansion, they do have a class action lawsuit against them. Like, what is happening here? Are they not talking to Disney when these projects are coming along? Are they just really that poorly managed and have minimal budgets that they can't fulfill basic needs with these games at their launches? It just sounds like this company is a mess. I just realized you have not played Knights of the Old Republic. Nope. I'm actually shocked at that. That that is crazy to me that you haven't like played. That is one of the best twists in video game history. It's up there with the me, Bioshock twist. Me not playing it or the game? The game. It has like oh. the, it's up there with the Bioshock twist. It's that good. Maybe if the remake I, ever comes out, I'll play it. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how that does. Because that it, <laughs> dude, have you have you fired it up on the um on the Xbox series? Like it it's 4K the whole thing. It's 60. Nope. It's it's classic Bioware. Like you like Dragon Age, the old school Dragon Age. It's classic. I was never that big on Dragon Age though. Oh. Uh, I mean it's 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 good. It still holds up. That's like Is it... to me when Bioware was like I mean they were they were hitting on all cylinders. That it was good stuff back then. So is it like Jade Empire good? Oh, it's better than Jade Empire. Hmm. Yeah, I'm surprised you've that's one that you don't even need to be a Star Wars fan because it's a completely unique story. I mean, it, it's still like okay, here's a lightsaber kind of thing, right? But it it definitely plays into it more like its own thing with like Star Wars themes. So you don't you don't need to have any knowledge of just Star Wars at all to play it, but I think it's a game that still holds up really, really well. And again, the story, if you go through it, there is a twist in there that you're like, oh, it's kind of like that sixth sense sort of uh, twist where you're like, now I got to go back and play the game again to see all this stuff and to see if it makes sense to me. Ah, man, that's it. Work. It does. It holds up. Go look at if you have you seen the comparisons on YouTube. Microsoft actually put them out because this is one of their like premier games where they wanted mm -hmm. to show off what they can do backwards compatible wise. So they compared it to like the original and then they brought it up and it looks so much cleaner and ran so much better. So I, I'm, I'm just surprised you never played it. It's it's good. No, I mean, the only Star Wars games I really had ever played were the mm -hmm. Rogue Squadron games on the GameCube. Yeah, but you don't really need knowledge of Star Wars for that either. Though. That's the thing, you know, you can just play it. Yeah, I kind of view the, them as basically arcade games. Where it's like, oh, cool, yeah. I'm flying a ship and shooting stuff and doing basic missions. But anything outside of them that was related to Star Wars, never had any interest in it. Knights of Old Republic, 94 on Metacritic. That's a pretty good score. 94. Yes, I recommend it. The second one isn't as good as the first one. The first one is definitely like top tier peak gaming. And uh, I recommend it, it, it because it's a little different. It's one of those ones where it's, it is kind of like that RPG setup again, like Dragon Age, where you pause time and you can do commands or just let everyone kind of fight things out. Um, but it's mm. uh, it's good. It's good. The characters are good. Uh, it's not too wordy. I mean, you can do the thing in like Bioware does where you have your conversations that you pick as you go through, but you can cut them short and make your person evil or make person good. Uh, it's, it's fun. And your person, uh, kind of like their appearance will sort of change a bit as you're going and you're getting more evil. So I, uh, I recommend it. I recommend it. I'd like play the first planet and then you get your lightsaber and see what you think that like kind of fleshes it out and it starts pretty quick because you're in a ship that's like exploding and it like, they wake you up and you're in a battle. So mm. it's, um, it's good. Uh, it's good. Maybe one day. One day. I don't think it's on Game Pass. They need to get that on there. I think it's cheap though, because it's backwards compatible. It's probably like ten bucks or something. So maybe during uh, a gaming drought. Hey, people in the comments, let Nate know. Should he, or in the live chat now, should he be playing Knights of the Republic? Is that truly peak gaming? Let him know. I mean, that, I'm telling you, dude, that's when Bioware was coming out swinging. They were at like the top of their game. I'm telling you. Yeah, but then Bioware put out Jade Empire and Mass Effect 1 and Mass Effect 2. That's, that's peak Bioware. No, Mass Effect 2 is peak Bioware. Mass Effect yeah. 2 was it, man. That was like, yeah, that Mass was Effect that when they, to me, was... that's when the pinnacle for them was that. I still got yeah, Nice Old game. Public over the first Mass Effect. 
Okay. Mass Effect Two. Well, that's no, when I everything think that, came I think together. That's, I think that's Bioware's like. I think that's their peak. That's their pinnacle right there. Is Mass Effect Two? Yeah, then so. Mass Effect Three happened. Well, and Andromeda. Yeah. Well. <laughs> hey, they got another shot, right? They're, they'll take another shot in twenty twenty eight. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay, that's fine. Anyway, Knights of the Republic. Everyone, let Nate know in the chat if you should or should not play it. The first one, not the second one. The first one. You gotta check those. Uh, check those replies, Nate. The Xbox Partner Showcase. Mm-hmm. We're gonna go through this. Uh, when I brought this up to many people, their response was, "There was an Xbox Showcase, so it's uh, unfortunately they didn't necessarily make waves here, but still, I have them all written down." Let's see. We have Unknown Nine Awakening, Sleight of Hand, Altars All by Myself, Creatures of Ava. Grief Phil survived the nightmare. Cross Chucky. It's a Roblox thing. Nate, you're, you know, uh, Sean got excited, then realized it was Roblox. Too late. Roblox. Oh, that's a shame. Roblox, yeah. The Sinking City 2. Final Fantasy 14. They do have the launch date for that is March 21st. So they've been kind of in like this beta period that we have not got past the login menu yet, by the way. Still working on that login menu. <laughs> it's very complex. Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> People still, by the way, message me now and then. It's like, you gotta try Final Fantasy fourteen. You gotta try it. It's like, yeah. We'll see how that login menu looks tomorrow. Stalker Legends of the Zone Trilogy. Good, good announcement. Good announcement. It's uh, mm-hmm. the first, it was three of them, but uh, I remember, remember one of them was kind of like an expansion of another sort of, but either way, the Stalker games are there. It's a trilogy. It's out now and it's 40 bucks, which I think is priced well. And obviously this getting set up for Stalker 2 coming at the end of this year, I think. Maybe. Seems like it makes sense. So I, I think they're trying to say that you don't need to play these to play Stalker 2. Like it's been so long. And honestly, Evan was even saying that eh, they, they might not have aged the best technically with everything else around it. But still, if you want to get into Stalker now, you can check the trilogy out. Big one next, Monster Jam Showdown. It's very random, but... Monster trucks. So there you go. <laughs> Persona 3 Reload, episode eight, Aegis. Uh, that's the expansion pass. Also, is available to Game Pass Ultimate members. So you do not have to buy it if you're a Game Pass Ultimate member, which is good. But then on the other hand, already showing up that expansion pass on huh, Atlas. All right. <laughs> okay. Hey, that was quick. I get, people, I get those people interested and hooked immediately. They were there right away. <laughs> yep. Here's another part of the game. We'll take that money. But. Game Pass Ultimate, so too bad, Atlas. <laughs> uh, that, that's September 2024 is when like the big episode comes out, but they have like smaller things on the build up to it through the expansion uh, pass. So more Persona content until the inevitable Persona 6 announcement someday. 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 I mean, on the plus side, from information I have heard, it does seem as though Persona 6 will be coming to the Xbox. So oh. Persona fans have that look something to look forward to. I'm not 100% sure if it's like a day and date with the PlayStation version, but considering the way the Persona games have been day and date with the multi-platform releases at this point, I'd say it may be a safe assumption to make that Persona 6 will be day and date Xbox and PlayStation. It'd be right. a really big deal if Microsoft is able to secure that on Game Pass, but I would imagine that would take mm. a lot to do. Because this would be yeah. the next mainline entry. You'd have to imagine Sony would be in a bidding war for the marketing rights to the game. Right. Whereas what Microsoft has secured so far for Game Pass has primarily just been remakes or remasters. So that may not have Sony's eye as much as the next mainline game. But, you know, if Persona 6 does come to the Xbox, that is a pretty big get. And it's kind of a compliment to the efforts Microsoft has made in Japan of becoming more relevant and working with the Japanese partners. So when the announcement does happen, that's going to be a pretty big moment. And we also have seen them secure games like, um, what's the Atlas game coming out later this year? There's Metaphor. That one. Yeah. Like, I mean, that, that's that's still a, that was a big deal. Team. Yeah, yeah, and that was a big deal. They announced it during the Xbox showcase. So Microsoft has been playing exceptionally well with Sega Atlas at this point, but Persona 6 is really just at next level 
tier announcement for them. And I am curious whether or not they can secure that as a day one Game Pass release. But we still have quite a ways until that game releases. So anything could happen contract wise. I feel like that. I feel like Persona 6. I, I know they've been working with Sony so much with these releases. Persona to me has just grown into a position where they don't really need a, a, a fun like a platform holder to come in and fund it and then give them time to exclusivity because Persona is just big on its own now. They should just be able to show up and put it on everything. Be like, nope, we're doing it ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's going to be on PC. It's going to be on PlayStation. It's going to be on Xbox. It's be on Nintendo's next system. Here it is, day one. Go for it. Like I, I feel like that Persona mm-hmm. is to that point. And then they'll probably report probably millions of copies selling in the first week. Like it'll just be like that. So yeah, I mean that's the thing. Uh, the Persona games have really caught on more in the western world in the last few releases where they're seeing a lot of success and they saw that huge success when it came to pc a few years ago where you know persona 4 golden when it came to pc did huge numbers where atlas was caught by surprise at the success of the game and since then we've seen them come to the xbox switch and such so persona's future definitely seems as though it's going to be multi-plat and it's such a huge shift from when we were younger and persona was strictly sony it's one of those franchises you associated to the sony brand and to see that now begin to disintegrate kind of it's kind of telling and is an indicator of the industry itself that these exclusives just don't work anymore the budgets are going up and all these companies want to expand their reach and how do you expand reach by putting it on more systems and that's something that we've even seen Microsoft now do. Yeah, I also think that that's the Persona series where before it was like highly niche. I mean, how many people out there have played Persona 1 or 2? Let's be real. Like it's not, not many. Uh, and Nobody. I mean, the prices of those games reflect that as well, right? You look and you're like, wow, okay. <laughs> this gives hundreds of dollars on the PlayStation. Well, all right. Uh, I think just Persona itself has grown and grown and grown to the point where it's kind of outgrown the idea of even being timed exclusive. And I know we see final fantasy being timed exclusives but i kind of feel like square played it safe and was just like we'll take the we'll take the bag from sony and we'll even out our costs and we'll live with that whereas i kind of think sega and atlas looking Mm -hmm. at this like oh we can we're gonna drive legit profits with persona 6 like the fact that it's been in development this long i kind of feel like they're they're putting a lot into it and i Mm -hmm. i think it's gonna be an impressive showing when it does when it does pop up Yeah, it's going to be a very interesting day when we see that first trailer for Persona 6, just to see the direction of the game, the visual leap the franchise will finally have. And I'm really interested to see which platform holder is going to secure that first trailer, because if it shows up at a Microsoft event, it'd be big. That's going to be a conversation. I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely, if if I'm Atlas and Sega, I'm playing both sides. I'm getting marketing from everybody if I can. (laughs) Who wants this trailer? Who wants this trailer? Who wants this trailer? Got to pay up. Yeah, I'd be in, I'd be at every presentation I can. Yep, there. These people got to give me money. <laughs> I'd be mm-hmm. selling marketing rights all over the place. But that that's interesting to hear that we could could see Persona Six on the Xbox day and date possibly. Uh, so it's interesting. Okay, I don't think I've heard that before. I think that's the first time I think I've heard that. I think up until now I've been under the impression that it's going to be probably PlayStation, maybe Nintendo or something. Interesting, Nate. We'll we'll, we'll, we'll keep tabs on that. Hmm. Mm. Okay, okay. We had the first Berserker Kazan, Kazan, Kazan. No, it looks, sure. I mean, it looks, looks cool. It's an action. <laughs> looks like an action adventure style game. Uh, we have Tales of Kinzara Zao. We've seen this game a few times. Kind of reminds me a bit of that Prince of Persia style gameplay, where it's kind of like the the Metroidvania style look, sort of side scrolling. So mm-hmm. I like those games. I'll, I'll, I'll be looking into this. Frostpunk Two. Unfortunately, I don't think this is my kind of game, but it is out there. Frostpunk 2, July 25th. And then Path of the Goddess. That's the one that mixes action and real-time strategy and is from Capcom. Ah, uh, yes. The game everyone thought was Onimusha last summer. It kind of reminds me of Monster Hunter 2, though, when I look at it, like the art style. <laughs> so, like Rise, Monster Hunter Rise. I don't know. It's, uh, looks all right. I feel like I need to just, that's a game I feel like I need to play to kind of get the understanding of what they're trying to describe to me. Yeah, get a feel of the controls, get a feel of the gameplay loop. And I believe it is a Game Pass release, right? Yes, it's been it's definitely been marketed that way with the Game Pass logo and stuff. So, yes, okay. I'm going to say it so is for now. I mean, that's something that we'll probably give a look then. Get a squad mm-hmm. of four. Just, yeah. I mean, we played Exo Primal to completion. 
We did. And now they're putting Mega Man in there to taunt me. Hey. Can't get Mega Man X9, but you you can you can have an exo suit that looks like Mega Man if you want. Thank you. If Thank you, you, Capcom. If you want to show your support of Mega Man, you have to boot up Exo Primal again. Yeah, no. I feel like I feel like do they give you the mm. suits? How does that work? I don't know if that is that something you gotta earn? Is that season four or something? I don't know. You might have to buy them. Mm. They just need to give me Mega Man. How about that? Like an actual Mega Man game. How about we do that one, Capcom? No, you take Exo. You gotta Primal give them Mega a game. Man. You built the backs off of Mega Man. You gotta give them a new game. Can't leave them behind. Yeah. Disrespect to the Blue Bomber. What do you mean? It's got a nice Exo suit, and they have some of the Mega Man characters in Exo Primal now. You know how many people are going to be exposed to Mega Man for the first time? Thanks to Exo Primal. Twelve people. <laughs> that's, Twelve. <laughs> that's about eleven more people than. The Mega Man base currently has. Uh, it's just me holding it up. It's, it's all me. Yes. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, <laughs> you'll regret this when X9 shows up and it looks awesome in the RE engine. Yeah, probably. <sighs> yeah, I know. Game Pass games. We do have Game Pass games for March. That is a thing. I have Xbox Wire up right now. And I just wanted to go over them because obviously we're, we're checking out a lot of the Game Pass games as they come out. Let's see. War, we have Warhammer 40k Bolt Gun. Paw Patrol World. Those are already out now. Yes. Oh. And then we had Control that just... Oh, wow. Actually, all these games just released now. I'm thinking about it because it's uh, Thursday. Uh, SpongeBob SquarePants. Battle for Bikini Bottom. Rehydrated. Control Ultimate Edition. No more mm -hmm. Heroes 3. That actually hit just now, and I am going to download that because I'm, I want to see what it looks like there on the uh, Xbox. I have it on the PlayStation 5, but I still have that version sealed. So I will uh, I will check it out on the Xbox, actually. Lightyear Frontier. There's a game preview. MLB The Show 24. Huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know that's your game, mm -hmm. Nate. You're going to play MLB The Show 24. I already know. I am trying to organize a Spawncast Network home run derby. Okay. And okay. nobody is interested in participating. All right. You know what? Maybe maybe I'll play that, Nate. We'll play home run derby. When does this come out? 19th. Next, okay. So it's out yeah, next, next week. week. Technically, okay. it comes out Friday, as in tomorrow, from recording if you buy the early access version. You get the early access version? I am not. Oh, it says Game Pass members can unlock up to four days early access plus deluxe edition bonus with the purchase of the digital deluxe add on bundle. Mm -hmm. I think it's is that how much cheaper is that? Forty dollars. I think it's like, yeah, 40 bucks. I just click. But you get all the extra content and such. It's not too bad, but four days extra. I mean, it's not that much time. Right. I do. Well, I guess it's because it's like for the weekend. Otherwise, it comes mm -hmm. out with the middle of the week <laughs> next week. Uh, the 19th yeah. Tuesday that people are like, well. You know, you got work and other stuff going on during the week. It's like, eh, I'll pay extra 40 bucks. And I'll just, technically, if you have Game Pass, that is still like $30 cheaper than a full price game. So uh, people will probably bite on that. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and Dead Island 2, that actually just dropped in out of nowhere like a week or so ago. Uh, so if you have not played Dead Island 2, I recommend it. It's a fun, and you know what? It's a fun arcadey first person melee focused kind of game. It reminded me at times of Condemned, actually, just brighter and more humorous. And I think it fits in perfectly on Game Pass. So that is, that is one I would recommend checking out. But I, out of the list here, you know what? It's really funny. I am probably most excited to go back to No More Heroes 3 on, I'll just say, more capable hardware than I originally played it on and see how it looks and runs that way. Mm. So Yeah, because my exposure to No More Heroes 3 was on the Switch where it did not look or run well. Yeah. So I'd yeah. probably... Give it a quick look on the Xbox just to see how that performance is. If it's smoother than it was on the Switch, maybe I'd commit some time to it. But MLB The Show, Control Ultimate Edition, I'll probably give a look because I had only played base Control. Um, but overall, it's a pretty solid list of games, especially in March, where early in the year things are slow. So you got a couple of Game of the Year tier candidates there. You got a quality baseball game right around opening day. It's a nice, healthy selection of games for everyone to, you know, explore and just to see if they maybe satisfy that gaming itch. 
you know what's interesting is Nino Kuni Wrath of the White Witch remastered was supposed to leave, but something happened and it's actually staying. So I'm not sure what happened. I don't know if like Microsoft figured something mm. out and they were able to keep it. Uh, it's just it's odd that they originally had that listed as leaving, but then they took it off like two days later and then they put an editor's note in here to reflect that. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. And I mean, maybe that is they just were able to renegotiate a new deal. And it's still a great sign of Microsoft Again. having that type of Japanese support, especially with this week, with the announcement that the Grandia collection is coming to Xbox. Oh, that's a good one, too. Grandia collection. That's good. Wow. OK, good stuff. Yeah, not, not a bad way to start. Remember, this is also going to be wave one for March. So we're expecting another, probably another Game Pass drop or like Xbox Wire drop. I would say next week, actually. So right around the time MLB The Show 24 comes out, you'll probably have another post go up that just outlines the second half of the last two weeks of March. Hopefully they have some fun stuff in there. So we'll, we'll see. And the Game Pass stuff is always, it's, it's just fun because, you know, if you're signed up for the service, it's like, okay, cool, what's going in? So let's see. We do have, I do want to bring up the Saber Interactive stuff, Nate, because I do think this is very interesting for a number of reasons. One, Embracer Group continues to, to shed talent, but also expenses. Now at this time, this deal is worth up to $500 million as it would include Saber Interactive, some of the subsidiaries underneath them, which uh, does include Nimble Giant, 3D Realms, Sandbox Strategies, New World Interactive, Slipgate Ironworks, Madhead Games, Fractured Bite, and then apparently they're also taking 4A Games, they're buying Metro, and Zen Studios, worth about $500 million and Embracer said the sale meant it would now cease all operations in Russia while improving its cash flow. And the other part that people noticed, there was a slide where Embracer is basically explaining how this breakup is going to happen. And in the slide, third bullet point down, it says a previously announced AAA game based on a major license. And that is a retained project that people are speculating and some it seems like even Bloomberg's kind of speculating this too with Jason Trier, that that is indeed Knights of the Republic remake and that it is still in play right now. If the game still remains in active development, you know, fantastic. Hopefully they are able to do something with it, but we've had so many reports around that game, even this year alone, suggesting that only a handful of people had been assigned to it that the game was essentially canceled or was going to be shelved it's hard to have any confidence in the future of that project but if they have retained it and they do plan on continuing to investing and keep it actively in development hopefully we see something of it my concern or interest would be is sony still involved here mm. or have they waived their exclusive rights to the game it's interesting because I would uh I almost feel like Sony backed away from it. It feels like remember they removed the trailer for it from their own channel on YouTube. Like it, it does kind of feel like they're like, eh, I think we're out. So I wonder if maybe they broke contract, somebody did, and it just kind of was floating out there, and then it got passed off to Saber, apparently has it now. And it seems that this is something that they're still gonna collaborate on, at least according to some of the reports and again, speculation with Bloomberg and stuff in there. So th some of these projects are basically gonna keep Saber and Embracer still kind of bound at the hip for probably the good part of the next five years. This would be a major one. And if they can get it done and it's not terrible, like if it's just decent enough and it kind of fulfills the idea and the vision, then I think this would be a big deal for Saber going independent, getting it done, something that Embracer had a really hard time managing. And Embracer, they're not, a, it's not a small operation there. They have like thousands of employees. So, I mean, they, they got a good shot at it. And I do also wonder what they, what do they want to do? I mean, they're now they're just kind of off thanks to private investors on their own. Do they try to create their own game? Do they contract out from, I don't know, a Nintendo, a Sony, a Microsoft? I'm curious. 
Yeah, there's really a lot of possibilities they could do here. And even with Sabre taking 4A, as you mentioned, they are behind Metro. It seems as though Embracer is going to retain the rights to the Metro series. So is that going to be a case where Embracer is going to collaborate with Sabre and 4A to continue the Metro, the Metro series? Or will 4A now be able to explore, you know, new IPs and such? So that's going to be an interesting new direction for them because we've all seen their talent with the Metro series. But if they're going to potentially begin a new IP or a new direction for themselves, there's limitless possibilities of what that studio could do. Now, if you're Embracer, I would definitely have that interest as the company to continue to collaborate with them and continue the Metro, the Metro series because you know the quality of a release you're getting there. You don't want to hand it off to one of your now in-house development teams that could do shoddy work. Because if you do, that permanently tarnishes the name of Metro. So it's going to be interesting how both of these companies kind of maneuver into the future of all future projects because Embracer has been going through a lot of growing pains. They continue to just shed talent and money. Whereas Saber, I'd say a lot of people's exposure to Saber at this point is likely through the Switch and some of the ports they have done. It's because their ports like, were impressive. Yeah, like The Witcher 3 and such. And they did yeah. do some original work like NBA Playgrounds, which was mm -hmm. well received early on in the Switch life stake. They did do a sequel that didn't do quite as well nah, as the first one. Well. Yeah. So it's going to be, it's really interesting to see how these two companies are going to approach their future. I'd say there's a lot of uncertainty, more so with Embracer of the two. But I think Saber, they must have a vision of what they want to do with the companies that they took with them. And hopefully they are able to just deliver the goods. Embracer, they still have a lot of, that's not even growing pain. They just have to find a clear vision of what they want to be as a company because they played with house money and then checked in clear and they don't know what to do right now. They are just in panic mode. But thankfully, you know, a lot of, thankfully with this, thousands of employees won't be laid off. Yeah. And they'll see a, a, a cash injection or just an injection of like 500 mm -hmm. million dollars so that i think would write the ship for embracer lowering expenses raising revenue and hopefully that means that they can uh at least get some of these games out because all we're hearing about is them canceling stuff you know, like like the time splitters and shelving things like deus ex and um, at this time they just need to get right get things evened out and then start putting money or putting games out to make money for them because if Embracer ever got to the point where they were like legit about to go under, that's a lot of there's a lot of intellectual properties, a lot of talent that would just kind of go away. I mean, I feel like someone would come in and mm -hmm. buy them and it might be Microsoft for all we know, but someone would look at that and be like, we'll give you this like low ball offer. And if you take it, awesome. We'll take all the IPs. But it's uh, yeah, that would it be feels... a messy. Yeah, I think in that situation, if Embracer ever just went on under it would be a fire sale you'd have companies yeah. like piranha sharks in the water of just trying to grab anything they can from them be it development teams or just ips because they do have so many iconic ips under their label now tomb raider alone is a very valuable ip then as you mentioned deus ex time splitters the list goes on and on and if you're a bigger company like a microsoft and you can get these for cheap Absolutely, you're gonna you're gonna go in and grab them because if you can find a development team to make new entries to these franchises, you really strengthen your portfolio a magnitude of you know ten times. It's just a question of will that day ever come? And when you look at Embracer, the baffling thing to me, especially with Time Splitters, why did you never just HD remaster the original Time Splitters games? It's that feels weird. Right there for you, yeah. Don't have yeah, to do anything they too brought crazy. That back and it had online and it wasn't like how Battlefront went with its release. It was it was good enough and mm -hmm. servers were up and working and you could we could jump online and play time splitters like the old days, but like you know, newer HD visuals, 4K60, that kind of thing. I'd buy into that. That'd be awesome. It's but yeah, at a nice price, let's say you know, $20, $30. Yeah. 
it would it also serve as a barometer of interest for the future of the franchise. If that comes out and you sell, you know, a million copies, you can say, okay, we can justify that investment into a brand new Time Splitters game. That's all they had to do. And they have so many IPs that they can do those exact type of releases and they're not doing them. They were I doing them at first, though. I don't know. At first they were doing them and then they kind of stopped. Like we had, didn't we get a, a what was, what you call it? A Red Faction remastered and like we were, we were getting mm-hmm. all these kind of releases. Sphinx, I think, was one. And oh, yes. it just, <laughs> but, it, but it just kind of stopped, <laughs> which was weird to me because that seemed like the easy way to just get some money going, get some revenue in. And then, like you said, test the mm-hmm. waters for certain things. Like I would love to see a new red faction with the kind of technology we have now based on what they were able to accomplish with the 360 back then, mm-hmm. even the PS2 and we haven't. So that's, I, I feel like remaster did okay for them, but that's yeah. Th- and there, I think there's so many opportunities for them and they just don't have enough resources mm-hmm. to get it done. I mean, I think that's what everyone's original vision was when we began to see Embracer just gobble up all of these companies and IP we thought they were going to do that like double A simple HD remaster of so many classic games. And then they never did it. And as that reality began to settle in, everyone became aware of how dire the situation at Embracer really was becoming. And now we're just stuck in that loop of constant layoffs, project cancellations, and just uncertainty of what the future is for the company. And it doesn't seem to be getting any better. Saber is was in a very fortunate position that they could essentially buy their independence, take talent with them, and hopefully it is a case of the grass is greener for them on the other side. We will soon learn whether or not that is the case and see what Saber is able to produce in the next few years. But it's a scary time in the industry as a whole. It's unfortunate that Embracer seems to be the leader when it comes to layoffs the problem to me though is when they cancel these projects like a time splitters that ip is going on the shelf for a long time if it ever comes off and it's like that no one else is going to come in and do anything with it it's just it's at embracer and it's just going to stay locked away most likely for Mm -hmm. a long time and that's the thing that's really deflating about it it's like oh deus ex yeah it's going to the back legacy of kane that's on the back burner. Like all these games now that could have been fun and maybe experimental and seem like mm-hmm. they were flowing with cash and could do all this stuff. How many, a hundred some odd games in development. And it sounds like they've canceled like 40 of them or something. And it, you just go, okay, they're yeah, playing it's... it safe. All those cool ideas, mm-hmm. probably not happening. So it's, yeah, it's not happening. And that's where, if you take a series like legacy of Kane, HD, the original games, yeah, get them well, out there. Fix the you... controls too. Fix the controls. Yeah, too. update yeah, the yeah. controls. You know, modernize it a bit. But then you have that cash injection. You see the interest for that franchise, and then you can decide whether or not you want to make a, you know, a brand new entry to that franchise. Otherwise, like Time Splitters, they were working on a new one. Now, I was a huge fan of the original Time Splitters games, but I do have to wonder whether or not the current market would be receptive of a time splitters game because you really have to approach it with that online mentality that's what sells first person shooters today so would they have made a time splitters that is good for 2025 or would it have been a time splitters that kind of paid homage to the time splitters we remember 20 years ago and if you want to pay that type of respect to the series roots just hd the original games yeah, because I feel like if you do a project and you come in with the expectation that, okay, let's try to sell a million copies and we'll be really happy. And mm-hmm. you, you could probably do that. You could probably get away with, okay, let's HD, let's touch up the old ones. Let's put it as a collection. Let's change up the controls a little bit so they're more modernized. Let's uh, let's make sure there's online enabled. And you can do some other fun things, extra stuff, unlockables. But let's treat it like it was that game that people remember. And let's keep our expectations to a point and let's not let scope get out of control and let's just put out a game and sell it but it does not turn into a live service thing let's just sell a video mm-hmm. game this time and yeah. that, that that i like that mentality right now because i feel like everyone wants that mm-hmm. everyone wants to make one game and that's it like just just it, to the end of time we just want our Fortnite, and it's like d- does everyone need to have their Fortnite? 
No, you can just have a self-contained experience and people will be happy with that as long as it is quality. And the companies aren't understanding of that because the shareholders, the VCs, they're viewing it as I've invested money and I want to see a huge return on my investment. Did you see the Monopoly Go number? Yeah, $2 billion in 10 months. 10 months? Those first 10 months of the market, $2 billion it made. And it's a free-to-play game mm. on your phone. Yeah, that's great success for them, but that's exactly one of the issues where you would have companies looking at that saying, we have to replicate that. Yep. <laughs> you know how that game makes money, by the way? I looked into it. It, it. The way the game apparently works, I haven't played it myself. I don't know. Did you play it on your phone? Your S5? I don't even think the game would be compatible. I feel like that S5. Phone. I feel like your S5 would melt. But anyway, I probably yeah. don't have the memory to download it. <laughs> the the way it works, it's Monopoly, sure, but it's single player Monopoly. As where is that sounds to my understanding, where you go around the board, you have money, and you build up each of these properties, and when you get them to a point, you then go to a new board. And the way it makes money is you have so many free rolls per hour, but if you want to keep playing, you have to buy more rolls for the dice. But you're not playing against money. anybody to buy, no from what i was under what i understood no it's mostly just kind of your thing and you're building up your properties and you're doing all this stuff with the board and then you uh because it, it they take turns but at times you're just going to walk away from the game for a couple of hours you can only bank 30 free rolls as well from what i saw so otherwise you have to buy rolls huh. to get around the board so that's how they've made two billion dollars is selling dice rolls Yep. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Imagine Something having so to make simple. a triple. Imagine having to make a quadruple A game to get like $500 million. And this Monopoly Go does it with rolling dice and selling you that. A single player Monopoly game. You know what? I'm going to reverse here the mini games from Mario 64 DS. And I'm going to mm -hmm. make the mobile games. And I'm going to make $2 billion in 10 months. You should. You just try making a mobile game, Nate. Let's see what happens. It's I'm, just, I'm, I'm just going to take the games right from Mario 64 DS. Okay. Find like the character's face. Um, what was it? What else was there? It was Blackjack. Um, they're all very basic. What are you going to call it? I don't know. Oh. Uh, Something. Good luck with that, Nate. We'll check in in a month to see how it's going, how development's I'll going. I'll find an engineer to remake them. Hey, go it'll on Fiverr, my, see how it goes. <laughs> it'll be my pal world moment. Pal world moments. Uh, well, I can't argue if you make $2 billion in 10 months. Like, I can't argue with you. Okay. I'd be long gone if that happened. You'd be gone. <laughs> Would you just buy like a piece of property out in the middle of nowhere? You buy like a... Uh, like an mm -hmm. island off of like the keys or something and you just never see you again you're just yeah. disappeared gone yep yeah. it shut down twitter accounts and everything It'd just be uh, gone it's goodbye gone. social media goodbye everything really? it might be two billion dollars in 10 months mm -hmm. what more do i need no 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 you can go around giving people money for fun then yeah i'd set up some charities and do some good causes Oh, I mean, like you can just give you can just give everyone money. Yeah, I could give some people. I think like you go. friends and people... such money. I'd make there sure everyone's go. taken care of there. There you go. I do have this question, Nate, and I think this is interesting. Final Fantasy Seventeen. When do you think that's coming out? Um, uh, let's see. Sixteen came out last year. It's twenty twenty three. Mm -hmm. okay. So. 2027, 2028. Okay. So you think basically at the end of this generation, we're going to have Final Fantasy 17 to close out, take advantage of maybe the larger install base. And then let's face it, they'll re release it again on the next generation, the PS6, Xbox, mm -hmm. whatever. Okay. Uh, yeah. My, my question now is based on what we're seeing currently with Final Fantasy as a franchise, mostly in sales, and what we're seeing right now with Rebirth, which. The sales numbers we know for Rebirth, we don't know the really the Western audience right now. Currently, it's all uh, Japanese sales based. It's not great for the lineage of Final Fantasy in that region. It had more sales numbers come out, ninety one percent drop from what was already lower than expected numbers. And I do wonder if Square is looking at this, thinking, 
are we going to get that that bag from Sony again? Are they willing to do it? And if not, it, does 17 have to be multi-platform? As in PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, PC, all day one. It, on the surface, I think it has to go multi-plat strictly because the Final Fantasy series is in decline. The series just doesn't this. have people the didn't appeal. like to hear that. People, people didn't like that when I said that. But it's the truth. I mean, when you look at the Final Fantasy franchise today, I don't think it appeals to as broad of an audience as it once did. I remember seeing games like Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VIII, and being, you know, 12, 13 years old and having a great interest in what that game was going to be. Did a title like Final Fantasy VII Remake or Final Fantasy XVI have any appeal to the current 12-year-old? Mm, it's that it youth doesn't, market. Doesn't seem to be. Yeah, it's that youth market that I don't think Final Fantasy is really catering to anymore. It's The series has tried to grow with the audience it brought in with Final Fantasy VII, I feel. And that's who they're still trying to cater to. So you're no longer catering to gamers from 12 to 40. They're now catering to an older demographic with the Final Fantasy series. Or they're trying to tickle that nostalgia bone, which led to Final Fantasy VII Remake and Rebirth and whatever the third one will be called. And you tried to do something new at Final Fantasy XVI, and you were met with a mixed reception. Everyone has their opinion on that game. Some love it, some like it, others hate it. But they tried to do something new. They tried to make it a little more action-y. They tried to go with a darker tone, try to tap into the Game of Thrones aesthetic and story direction. And you all saw that, you know, all saw that reception. So when it comes time for Final Fantasy 17, what direction do you go? Do you stick with what you do at Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy 16? Do you go with some sort of hybrid that would be 16 and 7 rebirth in terms of combat? Or do you do something completely new? Because right now it feels as though the Final Fantasy franchise as a whole has an identity crisis. It doesn't know what it wants to be. And the audience it's trying to cater to has also lost interest in the franchise as a whole. And when you look at the sales of Rebirth, especially in Japan, that region has moved on. Final Fantasy is no longer that big of a deal in the Japanese market. The decline has been steady over the last 15 to 20 years. You can see the decline with each new mainline entry. This isn't a matter of strictly install base, or one specific factor. This is solely related to both the audience, the direction of the franchise, and just the industry as a whole as it continues to change. So if you're going to continue to do mainline Final Fantasy games, I think the only direction for Square Enix moving forward is to make it multi-platform day and date across all platforms. Otherwise, you have to ensure you have a Sony, Microsoft, or whomever coming in with that time deal, but they're giving you 50%, 75% of development cost in that exclusive contract. That way it's a very minimal risk and there's no real gamble if the game comes out and doesn't perform. I I do feel like at this point, it Square has to kind of reset their thinking about this, this franchise because if, as we've kind of talked about the younger generation has been coming in and I, I feel like looking at the last few releases, I mean, 16 is controversial because it's like, it's an action game. Really? It's not, it doesn't feel like a traditional RPG that square would make it feels more like that devil may cry action game. Then you go to 15 and that didn't really feel much like a, I mean, it looked kind of like a, it looked like a final fantasy game. Sure. But like when you start playing it, it's like, ah, I mean, it, 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 either the, the, the group, it, the brotherhood thing is going to click with you or not. And there are points in that game where it kind of looked like, okay, there was some struggles with development. There were certain bosses and dungeons and stuff that were a little weird with quality issues. And then before that we had 13 and that was a whole thing. Like they, I feel like they haven't had a slam dunk numbered final fantasy that everyone's like, that's just good since 12. And that was on the PS two in like, when was that? Was that? Oh, 
was that oh was that oh four oh five when was when it's it's been a long time basically is my point it's been like 20 years just about since yeah they I had mean, that yeah, final fantasy yeah 12 was really beginning of that shift in terms of game design because as you remember final fantasy 10 was the traditional rpg final fantasy 12 began that shift to almost where it felt as though you were playing an offline mmo you had the automated battle system type thing going on there and it generally was well received you had 13 it did its thing 15 with the boy band and you constantly saw the series changing it just wasn't hitting those huge numbers anymore and i just don't think final fantasy knows what it needs to be in the current market it doesn't know which rpg it needs because we've seen the western rpg really just blossom over the last decade with titles witcher 2 witcher 3 dragon age even you know just from other say boulders gate 3 yeah. all of those types of franchises have really boomed in the last decade while the japanese rpg market has either stagnated or has declined and final fantasy is just in that decline right now so i really wonder what the future is for the franchise because final fantasy 16 was a decline from 15. it's also not hitting the sales numbers of final fantasy 7 remake and now you have rebirth coming in lower than final fantasy 16. so what is square enix internal expectations for these games are they meeting maybe their minimal expectations but they're not hitting the highs that they really hope to achieve and we still have the pc release of final fantasy 16 to come which could give it a boost if final fantasy 16 comes to the xbox that could also provide a boost but it's really at a time that final fantasy has to be on every platform it can be on because otherwise i don't see how you can continue to invest hundreds of millions of dollars into a project that the audience just isn't there for anymore and to me if, if final fantasy is becoming more western based as we're kind of assuming it is as we've seen sales shift away from japan well they're sale they're selling somewhere you know for some of these numbers they put out and i feel mm -hmm. like the western audience is becoming more and more interested it has been for like 15 20 years so and more like the otaku stuff and uh just kind of japanese culture and the games coming from there so i at that point to me square it's it's it sounds funny now because you you know we see like the sales numbers and stuff for the xbox but I, I do feel like going into whatever Microsoft strategy is for the next generation or even just right now at the Xbox, I, I think there is a market to tap into for Square with this growing interest in the West for Final Fantasy uh, on the Xbox platform if they legitimately push and actually make a sh like attempt at it because they're doing 14 now. Obviously, Microsoft is coming in to make that happen themselves. And I, I think in this case, it is a good idea for Microsoft to come in and I don't think they're going to pull the Sony card where they fund half development and it's just an Xbox thing. But I, I wouldn't be shocked if they came in and put some money on the table to make sure it was on the Xbox, at least. Like, it doesn't get left out like 16 and Rebirth and Remake and whatever the last one's called there. Kind of just walked past the Xbox because Sony was so willing to fund a lot of the stuff. I feel like Microsoft, for 17, Final Fantasy 17, I think it was a good idea for them to shift some money there if needed like if it's necessary I, I think that's a good play for them yeah if required i could see microsoft maybe contemplating such a thing but you also have to consider that sony has made these contracts on 16 um forsaken or forspoken and yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's forsaken yeah <laughs> it is yeah. forsaken it's both <laughs> and now with final fantasy 7 trilogy you have to be wondering is sony looking at this saying did we get a good return on our investment here? Did mm. this move hardware? Did this sell enough copies that it helped strengthen our platform? Because when you're investing millions upon millions of dollars in these projects to keep them exclusive, if you're not seeing a solid return, when it comes time for the next mainline Final Fantasy game, whenever 17 comes out, be it 2028, 20, 2030, are you going to come back and make a deal? Or are you going to look at it saying Final Fantasy doesn't have the draw it used to? Our money is better off in other projects. Right. Go multi-plat because we don't need you anymore. We've moved on to 
other IPs that we think can help strengthen our brand. So Square, you're not getting a check from us this time. You have to do what makes sense for your business. And if multi-platform is that decision, go for it. And if Microsoft wants to come in and Game Pass is still a thing in 10 years, and they say, hey, we're willing to give you $50 million to put Final Fantasy 17 day one on Game Pass, you take that opportunity. But it's a weird yeah. time because Final Fantasy used to be such a big deal. You used to it be was. able to look at the Japanese charts where they would sell a million copies on day one. Yeah, it's been overtaken now, by Dragon Quest, Monster Hunter, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Now you're looking at Final Fantasy VII Rebirth after two weeks, and it's barely over 250,000 retail copies sold. Yeah, it's a shame. It is. What happened? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think coming off remake, there's a lot of things that could have happened, but still seven is incredibly popular for all Final Fantasy fans. Just about you feel like just even that alone would have pushed it. But uh, I don't know. Something's going on there and it's it's not good for, not See, good for Square. <laughs> not to get into like some Final Fantasy seven related tangent. I'd say Final Fantasy seven original remains popular. But since the original PlayStation one game, we've had. How many spinoffs? How like many? Oh, like like Dirge of Cerberus, uh, that yeah. sort of thing. Crisis Core. Like, mm -hmm. A number Even, of them. You could say Advent Children, Ever Crisis. Cell phone game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have so many things, and they've kind of ruined the allure of some of the characters of Final mm. Fantasy VII. Like you have this, you have this deeper look into Zack and Sephiroth, mm -hmm. where it's like you're not you're not making it more appealing to people. You've actually convoluted the lore to a point where people don't know what is happening. You've Kingdom Hearts Final Fantasy VII to this point in the modern take. The original game still holds up in its own. And I think people who are playing Remake and Rebirth, you still have that nostalgia factor aiding it a little bit. But I don't think Rebirth can live off the nostalgia because people played Remake. They either loved the way the game ended or they hated the way the game ended. And if you hated it, you weren't going to buy Rebirth because you're kind of just over it. So that can lead to the decline. It feels as though maybe Square damaged the Final Fantasy VII brand by constantly tapping that well. And then they didn't give people the product that they thought they were getting. And it, yep. people have moved on. Yeah, I do think I like I feel like when whenever we get Final Fantasy 17 shown, there'll be a lot of excitement again. And it's it's going to come down to which direction they go in. And I wouldn't mind them, as I said before, going in a more not upbeat, but just more maybe a brighter like tone. It's just very dark and brooding the whole way through 16. Rebirth mm -hmm. will have those moments where it's it's just people are just having fun in the game and like the characters and they're at the beach or they're at the gold saucer or something, but then serious stuff happens and it's a huge tonal shift. And I feel mm -hmm. like when that happens, you go from those highs, that positive high, and then you get just crushed with something crazy happening. I feel like it hits a lot harder because it, it's so contrasting to what you were just doing um, that it just, it feels more impactful. Whereas with 16, I was kind of always expecting something bad and depressing to happen every hour pretty much so it was like eh, i was just kind of beaten okay i'm excited okay yeah i mean really the mm -hmm. the excitement of the boss battles might have been the the positive exciting part pot like that kind of thing whereas mm -hmm. it should be more like 10 where it was like that tropical kind of vibe and it is there were some bright points <laughs> to it but then some like serious dark relationship issues with with like uh, titus and his dad and that you know some serious stuff happened there but that's yeah i wouldn't mind them taking a more of a position like that uh, with the next yeah, one. 10, 10 walked the line with, you know, seriousness and some levity where you'd have those moments of tranquility where you'd be playing Blitzball. You got to see the people within the game's world just be able to relax and enjoy the basics of life and ignore the big issue that was sin. So you yeah. got that feel yourself of like, oh, I have some moments to relax and just take in the world and enjoy what the setting is whereas 16 was pretty much just hey we have to stop the end of time and the incoming apocalypse and the only downtime yeah. is to maybe pet the dog clive was basically always gravelly voice hmm. like you know he, there was I, I there wasn't really that moment with him where he was just like happy 
like, yeah, he never had a moment where he's just like, <laughs> yes, let's go have fun. Yeah, like that. There is something to that with Final Fantasy, like where you have those moments and it just didn't exist in 16. As I said, like the, the happy points were probably the, the icon battles and those weren't supposed to be happy. They just looked really cool. So uh, I, don't, I don't know. That's hey, he had, that, he that, had a tough that's what I'd life. like to see with 17. Yeah, I know. But that's that's <laughs> I mean, dude, Titus is. Well, OK, I, I don't know if I can say I, it. Can I ruin it's been 20 it's, years? Is it possible? Hold on a minute, because I said stuff about seven. It's and been that 20... was the whole thing, too. It's been 23 years since Final Fantasy X release. Okay. Well, Tina's literally watched his dad destroy villages in front of him as what looked like a really messed up whale. <laughs> you know, just like annihilated everything. Yeah. Uh, so that, there's some pretty bad dark spots in there, too. But it just, I don't know, it mm -hmm. felt more fun, I guess, in 10. And that, just because of that sort of thing. Where 16 was kind of like, all right, here we go. Depressing. Yeah, Game sixteen was like kind game. of sixteen was just kind of situation of like doom is all around you. Yeah. Whereas, in, whereas ten was a situation of hey, you have to live life to the fullest because sin could come in at any point and wipe us all out. Mm -hmm. We don't know yeah. when sin will appear, so that's why we're going to enjoy our blitzball tournament and we're going to just have these moments of peace and enjoyment because we know we're in a bad situation, but. We also know we have to live a happy life. And that's the nice line that 10 just perfectly approached. And that's why 10 is still regarded as one of the better Final Fantasy games. It's very good. It's a very good game. Yeah. If people, if you have not played it out there, it's on everything. So, and it came out 23 out. years ago. That was a, a sick release time. on the PS2. That was a crazy release on the PS2. Man, I still remember mm -hmm. that. That was awesome. Good days. Good days. Yeah, that's fantastic. Oh, Final Fantasy 10 3. That would solve a lot. We don't acknowledge Final Fantasy 10 2 as a thing. Okay, well, there's a nine remake floating around out there. Maybe that'll mm -hmm. people like that. I don't know. We'll we'll see. The world of Final Fantasy is uh I don't know. We'll I mean, see you can happens. dip into those remakes of some of the older games for a bit, but eventually you have to do a new mainline game, and that's where the problem really lies. They just don't know what direction to take the franchise. Yeah. I don't think the action route, fully action route has worked. I don't think playing around with these weird times. Maybe they do just say, you know what? We're going back to turn-based. We're going to do some wrinkles, but it's going to be turn-based. We're going back. Like a Dragon, Infinite Wealth has been doing it, and that game is awesome. So it's it's sold well enough for them. They seem happy with the sales. I, what if they, maybe they just do that. What if they want to approach something more similar to a Skyrim? Oh, okay. Like a, oh, what if they made Final Fantasy first person? <laughs> Let's not go that far. <laughs> I'm picturing that now. First person Final Fantasy. Clive can monologue to himself the whole time. Oh, no. Uh, that, I don't know. That would be a little, that'd shake things up too much, I think. But if they went back to where they had like a party and maybe they did. I feel like if Square can reinvent turn-based mm -hmm. again and figure that out, like they did the active, they're the ones who figured out really the, like the popularized that active time battle system. I feel like if mm -hmm. they could come up with something new for turn-based like that, and they've kind of done that a little bit with this Final Fantasy VII series, right? Where it's still kind of action, but you can pause time. If they can come yeah. up with something that's truly turn-based, but it has that wrinkle, I think that's what will take them to that next level and get and put 17 on the map, so... That's well, man, that's yeah. tough. I'm glad I don't have to figure that out. No, and luckily for them, they probably have, you know, another four, five, six years to figure it out. So hopefully they do. Because it would be it'd be a sad day in the industry when Final Fantasy loses all relevance. Yeah, that would be a shame. That would be because I, I still love seeing the new number one come out whenever it does. It's it's always fun to look forward to. I'm always always excited. But Square, you gotta just for relevancy's sake interest and i be honest establishing a new audience because you kind of have to again nowadays with again the the generation cycling through you got to get this game everywhere you can you just, you just have to yeah so and yeah they have to get it everywhere they can and i think they have to start making it appeal to the more the younger generation because the last Fortnite few had, art style let's not go that far but okay. 
Just like the Roblox? gameplay just has to be more welcoming to that younger generation. Because if you were a 12 year old boy when Final Fantasy 15 came out, was that a game? Of, was that going to be something that would have interested you? Probably not. Right. And then you look at something like Final Fantasy 13. You're, again, young. Were you going to look at something like that and say, oh, I want to play this game? Mm, probably that one probably not either i mean i'm i mean i was yeah you know, i was older when it came right. out i i was one of the ones who actually enjoyed 13 <laughs> when i played through it i thought it was fun but uh it didn't hmm. didn't go over well with a lot of the final fantasy purists the linear stuff didn't do it for people but i liked the it's funny because i hey, gotta get 25 hours in then it opens up people are like what no what are you talking yeah. about well That's... chapter 13 it opens up i promise get there no one really did that was the problem and they they tapped out after 10 or something mm -hmm. but uh i i was fine they still kind of had almost like a sphere grid sort of like crystarium where he's kind of went around it was more 3d and i don't know i i didn't mind 13 as much i think as other people like hated it i, I was think okay if 13 13 came out today, like a remaster, I think it would be well received. Auto HDR has HDR on the Xbox, runs 60 frames. It does, yeah. I mean, Xbox backwards compatible version of Final Fantasy 13 is fantastic. Yep. But I think if they put that whole trilogy out there today as a remaster collection, I think it would be well received. But it's just, that's since 10 is really where the shift began. Because I'd say even 10, if you were a younger gamer, you were able to look at that game and be like, ooh, this looks interesting. I want to try this series out. And they just moved away from that during that 360, basically the HD generation of Final Fantasy games have just moved away from catering to that broad market. They focus so much now on that adult industry that they're not creating new fans to bring with them. Yeah, I mean, they look at like nine. That was very much like with mm -hmm. the main characters and stuff. It wasn't anywhere near like what they have a 16 where there's M rated and look like Game of Thrones. So that was more gen like a general audience there with with that. Yeah, one. But I mean, like you had detail. <laughs> yeah. Do you think I mean, do you do you think we're going to see the remake trilogy go anywhere outside of PlayStation? Like, will it ever show up on Nintendo or Microsoft's platform in the future? Eventually, yes. I you think so? I think it's going to be a situation of Sony probably did secure it as a trilogy, and then yeah. once the trilogy is out on the PlayStation brand of systems, we will see it come to be at Nintendo and Xbox systems. Yeah, I could see that. I wonder if they just release them all at once. I assume they're not going to stair step it because that would be weird to do that all over again. And I don't think they put in a yeah, collection. Just, like just I, do, I don't know. Maybe do all three in a single calendar year every like three months or something. Yeah, that could work. It could work. But that, that, I mean, that would obviously help them with sales too. So I, they're not going to, I'm not expecting any of that on the Switch. I would expect it on the next system. But that would be cool. I mean, I think people would like that. Who knows? By the, by the time that all happens, cell phones might be able to play it and they might get it on there too. So there you go. I mean, the iPhone plays Resident Evil 4 right now. So you could probably do that too. True. That's true. Yeah. But. That's uh hey, future of Final Fantasy always following along. They got Square Enix got that partnership, it seems like, with Microsoft, or at least just renewed interest, which is mostly probably just Microsoft hating the money. But uh if Microsoft mm -hmm. can build that relationship over the second half of this generation, going into Microsoft's next generation, I think Square could be a big partner for them. So they need to I think this should be a a priority relationship for Microsoft to build this generation. Yeah. So. I mean, they definitely made efforts during the 360 generation fell off a bit during the xbox one generation and then yeah. kind of the beginning of this generation they definitely had a somewhat of a working relationship when you had all the final fantasy games on game pass you had octopath traveler one on game pass we should be getting octopath traveler two on game pass mm -hmm. in the very yep near future because it's supposed to be a spring release and spring hey look out for those game pass announcements could be in there and then we just had Visions of Mana in the last Xbox yeah, our, uh, Xbox Direct in January. So they're definitely trying to cater to Square Enix in a big way. Making moves. I like it. I like it. I like it. We'll see. We'll see. But uh, that is, I think that's actually everything for Direct Xbox tonight. Got everything down. Yep, we're good. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for uh, episode 13 of direct xbox once again shout out to all the members over on the spawncast patreon you can check that out link down below in the description nate any parting words for the good people out there 
I will not play Knights of the Old Republic regardless of how you comment. What? Oh, I, th- I, th- I actually, it's the funniest part is Nate. It's like you with this game is like Sean with Final Fantasy 16. I think Sean would like Final Fantasy 16 if he plays it. I, I can't get him to play it. I think you would like Knights of the Republic if you played it. I can't get you to play it. And both of you have the system right in front of you to do it with. Yeah, it's a shame. It is. A, it's a true shame. Well, you better hope the remake happens. But the remake's probably not going to play the same. So, could be better. Could be. Probably won't. <laughs> what a shame! Yeah. What a shame! And people out there need to bully <laughs> you for it. Cyberbullying should work here. <laughs> Yikes! Get I'm after advocating him. for bullying. Hey, this is nice old public. We'll make an exception. <laughs> All right. Thanks everyone for joining us. We'll be back in a couple of weeks to see what Microsoft's done. All right. We'll see you guys then.